What's up, guys? This is Zach Selwyn, lead singer of Zachariah and the Lobos Riders and Country Linen. You are listening and watching the All Over the Place podcast where the fun sanity never ends. You know what it is, y'all. Hello, and welcome back to the All Over the Place podcast, the official podcast of Media Pub Live. I'm your host, Eric Provoznik. Welcome, everyone. And don't forget to like, subscribe, share all over the place on all your socials. Join tonight. Jim Culver's back in the house. Hey, hey. How you doing? I'm fantastic. How are you tonight, Jim? I'm excellent. And joining us back in the studio, the quote-unquote studio tonight. Not, not in, It's not insert only tonight. Christine, welcome back. Hey, hey. Hello. And uh, tonight, uh, well, Mar Marty is still on vacation in that undisclosed location somewhere not here. And uh, But joining us tonight, we are very, uh, very uh, excited to have on the show uh, a man who's whose eclecticism lives up to the name of this show all over the place. Please welcome musician and producer, Danny Saber. Danny, thanks for joining us here on All Over the Place. Thanks for having me. Well, we, we are here uh, in anticipation of uh, a picture disc coming out. Uh, Danny, of course, uh, among his many uh, different uh, accolades, uh, he worked on 25 years ago on the, or the release of Michael Hutchins's first official solo album, the self-titled solo album. And now um, Danny is, uh, and uh, Boss Sonics is releasing One Way and, as well as with uh, with Save My Life uh, on, on Picture Disc. And before we get into the questions, I just want to say, as uh, as you can kind of see here, folks, we got we got Michael over there, the little uh, picture tin, a uh, little bit of an NXS fan. And uh, oh, just a reminder, we're not elegantly wasted, at least not tonight, but we're still going to try to be better than oasis so danny thank you so much for you know continuing to maintain and revitalize michael hutchinson's legacy with, with with everything that you've done in the last 25 years with him oh yeah i mean you know what can i say it's 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 i'm, I'm just appreciative to have the opportunity to do it and mainly like the response from all the fans you guys everybody has been so positive and you know, that's really at the root of this is to try to get Michael just recognized, you know, for the great front man he, he was and, and, and shift the focus back to, you know, his 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 greatness and his influence and, you know, his his talent. And, and that's a big part of why, you know, we're putting this stuff out. So I appreciate it. You know, all, all thanks to you on that one. So uh, and, you know, uh, one way was originally released uh, in in, uh, in, a, in a different form, uh, different mix on the Michael Hutchins' last rock star. And so, uh, what what did you want to do with it? What inspired well, you yeah, to do a mix for this? So far, you've done so perfect with your facts because there's been so many like sort of you know how how things are. People pick up on stuff and then they kind of make it their own little angle on it. The the, the reality is, and I'll, I'll go through the story because I'm sure you know, even though I've told it. A, few times now you know there's people that don't know so essentially i worked with michael um i was approached by michael in 1995 because he was a big fan of that big poster behind me the black grape record and he was in the process of developing you know a solo sort of sound outside of in excess let's say and he had been you know sort of trying you know stuff with different people he had his own little setup in the south of france where he would work on ideas and he connected with Andy Gill, they started writing and getting some tracks together. And then he heard the Black Grape record. And I think, you know, something went off like a light bulb in his head. He was just inspired by the sound and the production. And he approached me through Sean, the singer, to initially come in really to help define the sound that he was looking for. Because he was always on this mission to discover new music and just, you know, he was one of those kind of, you know, consummate I call it the consummate front man. You know, he was always chasing some sort of sound that was in his head and trying to expand on what he had done. And he never wanted to rest on his laurels, you know. And again, I've, I've said this, it's not it's not a knock on anybody. But when you get in a band that's that big, you know, sometimes it becomes, a, there's a lot of pressure to maintain what, you, what, what you've accomplished and Michael was somebody who really needed to, you know, chase his sort of artistic, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, sensibilities or whatever that energy that that he got that charge from from always pushing the envelope, and it wasn't an either or thing. It was just having an opportunity to go places he might not be able to go in the confines of a band, and that's really what what initiated and started it. Cut to you know the record we were working on was basically it was pretty close to being finished. We had well, we had twelve songs when he died, and a little time went by, and B two picked the record up, and then I. I sort of mixed it with John X and we finished it. That came out in 1999. And then about 10 years later or so, a little more, a little less, it turned out there were a bunch of uh, songs like sort of in a vault. They were all on two inch tape. And this was all stuff Michael had been sort of working on while he was making the rounds. And there was about 30 ideas. And uh, that was the material that sort of all of this came from. But it became apparent that if we were going to, you know, do anything with it, it didn't really make sense to just put a record out, you know. And at that point, we needed a vehicle to market it. So the idea was, oh, let's just get a documentary made. No biggie. And that took another 10 years. And uh, so, yeah, One Way was featured briefly, you know, in in The Last Rock Star, where the intention was always, as it only aired in Australia, it was finally funded by uh, Seven Networks Australia to, you know, air the film in Australia. And then we were going to recut it sell it internationally, and then release all the music with the international release. So the music was never really released. It was just, yeah, there was moments, it was like a, a little segment about one way that's probably a minute. And there was, you know, but the song was never really front and center, you know? So that's sort of the long, short story. <laughs> the, the embryonic stage. Right, uh, yeah. Now, you know, minus a thousand details. <laughs> so, I'm really curious to find out, like, so did they just call you one day from the vault and say, hey, we've got all this old stuff? Or... He was looking after Michael, you know, he was looking after the day-to-day -day, um, sort of, you know, because because even with Michael outside of NXS, there's a lot of, there's business to manage, there's things to take care of, and he, you know, he left a, um, a company or whatever, and the guy that was sort of managing the day-to-day -day stuff, he reached out to me being that I was really the last person who was really, you know, me and Michael had a pretty, you know, anybody that knew the situation knew we had a really tight relationship and he was very, um, you know, what we were doing, he was very excited about it and enthusiastic. I got a beautiful letter from his father after we finished that record, actually. It's one of the best things, most rewarding things I've ever got. So I guess it made sense. Oh, well, you know, let's see, because we didn't know if there was even anything there, you know, it was like, oh, it was all on two inch tape. So we had to kind of go through it and see, well, is there even anything here? Is it worth doing anything with? So it was a process, you know? Was um, it hard to work on? Well, not at that stage, because I mean, the, the hard, the hard thing was, you know, we were working literally, I think it was like, you know, on the, on the, I can't remember the days now, but I'd like just say it was a Thursday or a Friday. We played at the Viper Room. That was the last public appearance he ever made. He was in LA and we were working on songs. And then he literally was on an airplane and two or three days later, he wasn't here anymore. So yeah, I needed like, it took a year. I didn't want to hear the stuff for like a year after that. But then, you know, cut to that much time's gone by it, you know, and now it's, 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 it's great because like just, you know, having the time away and, all the time going by, it's kind of put everything in a context and 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 you have the 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 benefit of history and time going by to really get a perspective on the situation that it's hard to see when you're in it, you know? So yeah, yeah, the hard part was ninety-eight, you know, and then getting into ninety-nine and kind of coming back and taking a look at it then. But then by then it was like, well, let's just do everything we can to to fulfill, you know, what his you know, what he would have wanted is wishes. You know, that's always sort of been the, you know, at the root of this. What was the response from the other band members? Were they involved in the process at all? Or? No, I mean, look, I, I, I mean, you know, I'm never going to say anything to knock in excess or, you know, without in excess, none of this would really mean anything. That was what put Michael where he was. And, they were an amazing band. I mean, one of the great things about, uh, you know, this whole process of getting that movie made is we went through a bunch of different directors and, and the first director we really got traction with was Julian Temple. And I don't know if you guys know who he is, but sure. he did become like, um, the filth and the fury and, 
uh, he I met him because he did a movie about uh, Joe Stormer and the Clash called The Future Is Unwritten, mm -hmm. and I mean, amazing, amazing, talented director. And uh, we actually kind of got to the point where we went into a development phase with Julian. And you know, this is pre-internet, pre-YouTube. Well, it wasn't pre-internet, but it was pre everything's on YouTube. You know, and uh, he brought in a researcher, and we amassed like about a hundred DVDs with every piece of footage you can imagine. And a lot of it was MTV news clips and stuff. But one of my like responsibilities once we got into the last rock star was to kind of go through that stuff and really get rid of the stuff that wasn't relevant. So I'm probably one of the preeminent experts on it in sense because I've just watched everything that exists on them just because I had to. And it really, really gave me an appreciation for how good they really, really were. I mean, they were good band, man, and just endless hits. You know, and I think back in the day, it was like, whatever, you know, I, I've always said it was never, you know, it's like when you see a band like, let's say, Duran Duran now, and you see how well they're doing, and, you know, In Excess would have been no different if Michael had lived. It would have been everything, you know, and hopefully he would have had this nice little solid solo, like, career ground to stand on, but all roads would have always led back to In Excess. You know, that's from where I'm sitting. Like, you know, I can't speak for them. I, I they, They've been... Uh, you know, there's been no criticism or anything. So, you know, I, 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 I like, you know, I take that as a positive. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, not to sound cocky, but the song came out pretty good. You know, it's been really well received. And that's the most important thing to me that, you know, the fans are feeling it and people are feeling it, you know, because it would sort of undermine the whole thing to just put out some garbage. You know, it has to be, you know, that's the thing. In Excess had a really high standard for their, their records and, it's got to live up to at least that, you know? It's definitely good to hear his voice again and on something that hits also, right? Yeah, like, again, it's that's the one thing you can't make people like it. Like, that's one part of this. You have to kind of put it out there. And, you know, and I felt confident and good. And, I mean, there's, there's more songs, too, by the way. So this isn't the only two. You know, there's some more stuff. And, and that's why I've kept the – I made sure, though, that we're out of the, the 30 or so things, there's, there's a solid seven. You know, and, and 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 there's about three that nobody's heard a peep from. And there's a couple that have like with the last rock star, I think, you know, Save My Life was in there. That sort of had the was the end title and had 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 its moment. But again, they haven't been released, they haven't had the focus on them as songs, and they really do stand stand up, I believe, you know. And of course, Bernard Fowler worked, and he did uh, what one, maybe two songs on the on the solo oh, album. And no. so what was like get that getting him in to do uh, to work on Save My Life. Well, yeah, I mean, but like, look, look, here's the thing with Bernard. For like, and, and again, you know, you were mentioning the Stones earlier. One of the best things, I mean, there, there's a hundred best things about working with the Stones, but but one of them is the people that are, are you meet in, that are in the studio, because at least when I was working with them, everybody's hanging out. And it was like crazy because I ended up playing bass on two songs. You know, and Daryl Jones and Doug Wimbush were in the control room. It's, it's it's like LeBron and Michael Jordan are on the bench and I'm in the game. It's like preposterous. But that's the beauty of music, you know. And Bernard was, you know, uh, he's always been like just a solid part of that equation. And I got to meet him and I've had like some really unbelievable friendship for life. But what most people don't realize about Bernard is he's sing he's sung on a lot of records, man, you know, uh, uh you know, the public image, man, the road rides with you. Bernard's on there doing those backgrounds. Uh, they're their lead parts, though. And he's the master of, like, he can double. He has an ability. And, like, with Michael's stuff, it's pretty defined. You can hear what he's doing. He's doing all that choral stuff in the um, in the uh, choruses of Save My Life. But, like, with Ozzy, he's doubled Ozzy's voice. And live, you know, he can back. He's got this ability. There's nobody like him. Let's just put it that way. He has a skill set that's very unique, you know, and he's a great singer in his own right, too. But he's singing like on uh, Future Shock, Herbie Hancock. That's him singing the lead on that. There was a great thing in Rolling Stone about him that really kind of, you know, because he, he started with the Peach Boys. And the Peach Boys was probably one of, if not the first club acts to have a hit record. You know, so he goes back to like. You know, he's just had an unbelievable career, but yeah, he's like my secret weapon, man. <laughs> yeah, I, I love I loved his stuff in, in the last Rockstar. I'm, I'm when I saw his name was, uh, you know, the arrangements on Save My Life. I'm, I, 
like I, I can't wait to get that on uh, to drop the needle on that one. Looking forward to it. And you mentioned, you know, finding Michael's voice. And you, you go back to it with Michael's history, and Max Q came at a uh, came at a time when he, he was, it was a little bit of, uh, in between time with NXS albums, and that that album didn't really go over too well. So, what was it like for you to find that voice for Michael as he was heading into another solo project between NXS things? Yeah. Well, yeah, because with the Max Q thing too, don't forget that came out at the height of their fame. Yeah. Right? Yeah, there was a lot going on there and and that's really what set the table for this in a sense where like you know michael kind of left a weird bad taste in his mouth so he made sure going forward he had complete control over everything he did outside the band that's part, partly why i'm in a position to do this and um you know as far as that side of it it's just been very um i don't want to use the word easy but it's 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 because like we you know we, we spent almost two years working together on and off. So that's a lot of time. That's a lifetime for, for you know, especially with when you're doing something creative like music, you cut all the, you know, if it's being done in a sincere way, it cuts out all the bullshit. And mm -hmm. You get to know somebody really fast. And, you know, we have like, you know, a couple baseline things that we stuck to, which was A, you know, the only, um, you know, nothing, nothing's off the table, meaning we're willing to go anywhere and try anything if that's where, you know, the music leads us. And then just like Michael told me, um, it was kind of liberating for him just to be in a position to have like, if he had an idea in his head for X, Y, or Z, because even though he wasn't really a conventional musician, he was a very musical person. And a lot of times he would have to sing ideas and just, he had so much going on in his head musically that to just being a, have the environment of just building everything around him. Nothing was, you know, we didn't rule anything out. We tried, and even if it wasn't the right thing, you always say you got to sometimes go to the wrong place to get to the right place, you know? So by the time it got to working on stuff, you know, obviously I give anything for him to be here, but you know, we had a strong enough sense of where we wanted it to go. And it's like, just like I've been saying, sticking to the mission, you know? And that was the mission, just like, let's just go where the music takes us. and not like you know be afraid to, to to take it wherever we want to and you know when it's working you can feel it you know so he left me with a pretty strong sense of all that so that's why i feel pretty comfortable you know just kind of doing my thing which is i'm very stream of consciousness anyways the way i work it's just, i let the the songs and the music and especially with a singer like a michael or bowie or i've had the opportunity to with david bowie's vocals and bono you know Mick Jagger, I've been very fortunate. I've got to work with the you know, greats. And the one thing they all have in common is there's so much, like with Bowie, I did a remix of um, Little Wonder. And when you stripped all the music away, there was like, I could hear a whole finished song just in his voice. It's crazy the way it was layered. I really grabbed the guitar and started. It told me the vocal will tell you where to go if you listen, you know? Folks, this is Dan Saber here on All Over the Place. Danny, once again, thanks for joining us here. And uh, you mentioned Bono a little bit ago, and you know, my, uh, you know, Mike. Uh, you don't know it at the time as big a fan as I was. Of course, like you say before the internet, before you, you just know of all these relationships that uh, artists have, unless you're like super, super fan. Um, but going back and learning that that Bono and and Michael had had a, a good, an excellent friendship, and then, but a, a good friendly rivalry going. You know, uh, you know, like uh, I think Max Q. I'm listening to that a lot lately. And just how I see the influence that had on something like Octung Baby and Octung Baby, you get welcome to wherever you are. And then back and forth with that, with those guys, just helping each other uh, just go to a next level. But what was it like for you to bring to, to get Bono to work on Slide Away and then just, just doing it posthumously with his well, I think Yeah, I mean, to be honest, that was kind of more Andy kind of initiated that. Well, I initiated, but Andy's the one who kind of ended up sort of like executing that sort of actual scenario. But one thing I can tell you is that you're right about the sort of friendly rivalry thing, you know, and that's a big part of the message that I, you know, want people to know is just how respected Michael was. I mean, like with, you know, the Stones, for instance, when I first, I first went to London after sort of got the call, like, hey, you know, I heard some music. Yeah, this is dope, let's get together came over and we had, we, we, we were a day or two into working together and we all went out and, you know, like I was, I've said, Michael was like the first real big rock star I ever worked with, you know, 
And, uh, you know, so it was like expensive dinners and Dutch and paparazzi. And we went to this club called Brown's and um, Mick and Ronnie Wood walked in, which for me at that time, I was just like, shit. I mean, it was like, close I ever been to Mick Jagger with freaking L.A. Coliseum. So, you know. <laughs> Next thing I know, you know, they're they're well, they're chatting about like you know, they're both because Mick had been working on a solo record too at the same time, and the next thing I know, uh, uh, Mick sits down with me and you know, Michael had been raving about me. Oh, this is you know, you got to work with Danny. He's amazing and da You know, he just did Black Grape and he had made the Black Grape record, and uh, it just shows you a how generous Michael was. Like he could have, you know. He's like, no, oh, you know, he was always trying to hook his friends up. And a lot of people benefited from having a relationship with him, I'll tell you that. But it also shows how much Mick respected Michael's opinion, you know. And it's the same with Bono. They all, you know, I mean, Michael said in the movie, he had it all. You know, he was a very, very unique, one-of-a-kind individual. But, you know, he had all the God-given stuff you could want as a front man. But he also was, you know committed and dedicated and, and as an artist you know he, he really really you know if he was trying to get into acting would be more he was in, he was trying to do more acting that was one of the things you know but he took it really seriously man it was like he really you know prepared for for, for, for readings and like because i remember he'd be doing that on the side so you not to say he didn't have his fun wild side he did but this idea that he was this you know monkey swinging from the chandeliers you know it's true but there's more to it than that he was also when it when it was time for that he did that better than anybody, but he also had a side to him that was very committed to, to it. And he was super respected. And I think that sort of going back to the Beach Boys and the Beatles and, you know, Oasis and Blur, whatever it may be, that kind of healthy sort of like competitiveness amongst artists, you know, I don't know, still something that's prevalent, maybe. But I think that's what made everybody, made everybody else better, you know? Got to step up. Yeah. You mentioned uh, people yeah. just that, that um, respect that they have for Michael. Who has been like uh, some of the more unusual people that you're like have come up to you and said, thank you for putting this out here. I really, I really like what Michael did and thank you for continuing to, to release some of his music. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't use the word unusual, but I will say this more not, you know, look like from the, you know, people that were, you know, musicians or whatever, every, but he respected him and, and that's been super cool. But what's interesting about him is the fact, like he has, his, he had the very unique sort of effect on fans, you know, especially females of a certain age. And he inspired a lot of passion and just love, you know, in a way that's a little different. You know, I've been lucky to be around all these different bands and each band sort of has their own culture, you know, especially when you're talking about bands like the Stones or U2 or Enix, they have their own culture around them, you know. And in, in, in Michael's case, you know, he inspired some people. I mean, there's just a lot of fans, and, and, and I don't want to ever sound like I'm knocking it because it's beautiful, you know. But there, some of the things that I've been hit with have been pretty crazy, you know, and a little different. <laughs> <laughs> that way, you know, all kinds of things. You know, Michael came to me in a dream and he told me I had to find you and just stuff like that, you know, which is great. It's fantastic. I would never knock it. But it's, <laughs> well, I'm still waiting for NXS to even get a nomination for the Rock Arnold Hall of Fame, however you want to look at that institution. But, but I mean, they're a band that is Regis. well overdue, but uh, that, that's, that's, that's a different podcast. Yeah. And that's hopefully part, you know, which can help a little bit. I mean, I don't be arrogant enough to say I was going to get him in. You know, they they check all the boxes a hundred times over. It's 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 obviously, you know. But I think also part of it is, you know, it's it's like he, he didn't, you know, he left us under, you know, the circumstances were unfortunate, and that's that's the thing. Like the dust has settled. Now it feels like enough time's gone by, and it's time to recognize those guys, you know, the way they should be, and that's a part of it, you know. They deserve to be in. I don't think anybody would argue with the, the the achievements, you know. So it's just the will and the right story and just getting the momentum, you know. And there's people working on it, working hard on it. So, you know, hopefully it'll happen. You want at least one Facebook group about uh, the petition to get them in. So yeah, just again, patience, persistence, and well, Jim, once, Jim once again, thank you for doing Scavall. what you do. Yeah, thanks, Jim Scavall. I can always never pronounce his name, but he's he's really you know 
organized a, a, a real serious effort to try to at least get the fan base marshaled. And so that's there and there's petitions. And so I, I think I think at some point in the near future, hopefully they'll be on, they'll, they'll get it. I mean, they deserve to be in it. It's, well, so. I, I'm an umpire in my in my uh, spare time, and uh, if the moms or the dads, someone's blasting like in between any music, I say, "You want to get on my good side? Play Bruno Mars, In Excess, or Weird Al Yankovic." And as soon as I say <laughs> In Excess, they're like, "Oh, oh, yes!" And next thing you know, you either got Guns in the Sky or Need You Tonight. So it's it's there. I think again, just scratching that surface to you know, get like say getting get some momentum going. Yeah, well, the wheels are in motion, man. So you know, and this is it. Like, like just getting the word out and helping in any other little way, you know, this can help. Hopefully and folks, we'll don't forget to go to, uh, to Boss Sonics. That's B O S S S O N I C S dot com. Pre order your, your picture disc of One Way and Save My Life. Definitely check that out. And you know, I, I mentioned a little earlier, we, it's now the, uh, the 25th anniversary since the solo album All uh, right. so came out. And uh, looking back here, obviously vinyl, a big part of my life. Uh, can we uh, possibly look forward to that on Record Store Day? Well, well, I don't know. About, uh, eventually, hopefully, but I wanted to show you guys, make a little news. So we did get, just for people who have purchased it already, you know, we're in a pre-sale mode, but we did get the test pressings in, and they, they, they not only do they sound amazing, but, you know, the, the quality of them is, is amazing. And, and what's kind of cool is this sort of initial inspiration for this came from some remixes I did for Marilyn Manson. But I noticed, like, this is my Marilyn Manson that Don't Like the Drugs remix. And if you look at, you know, and this is Universal Records, I mean, the, the quality of the product is, is, is top shelf. So I'm really excited to get, to get these things in and get them out to everybody. And I feel like once we have it in hand, uh, you know, people will, will, will be that just more excited about getting their hands on one, you know. And like, here's another one I, I, I did. Let me take it out so you guys don't get the glare. But uh, where is it here? Well, this is, and again, this is a, a Dean Carr photo, I believe, which is also the little photo you got to meet. So <laughs> the quality, the quality of, of ours is, 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 I think it was probably made in the same plant. They look amazing. So, That's some really cool artwork. Yeah, isn't that cool? You know, so obviously when we get the actual picture on them, uh, it'll be like, you know, reflecting something like this. So I'm pretty excited, man going to be really really good good cool little little item you know and i purposely wanted to do something that was also collectible you know and and so because i know a lot of people don't have turntables but it's just a cool thing to have you know and will these events will they be available on uh, streaming services as well yeah eventually i mean we're putting i'm working on all that kind of stuff i mean for now the main thing was just to kind of you know, it, it's so much time has gone by, and 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 like I said, the fan base is a real tight knit community, and and I've had a nice relationship with like all the, you know, like a lot of the people that 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 run the um, fan pages, and like the guy Jim I was telling you about, and uh, um, there's the In Excess podcast with Bridget, and you know, so I've had a nice sort of relationship with the fan base over the years, and they're all aware, they know what's going, they know about the stuff, and when's it going to come out? When's it going to come out? So it's finally like, you know, just between COVID and a lot of things that, it, it, you know, another movie came out after Mystify. I just figured, well, let's drop a song and get it out there and start to get some momentum. And then, you know, in the grand scheme of things, like what you were saying would be great to be able to take all the best of the solo stuff with the new stuff and package it and do some special packaging. So who knows where the roads are going to lead. For now, the focus is on one way and the vinyl and you know one thing i've been careful is not to get ahead get over my skis so to speak, you know one thing at a time let's get this stuff delivered to the people and uh get everybody their vinyl and hopefully you know a lot more will jump in and you know as that I'm a patient man I, I can wait for standing on a rooftop in madness i can wait <laughs> <laughs> well madness yeah so you know about madness i think standing on a rooftop was on a b-side of something that's not one of mine Okay, so, well, I, I, these are things I saw like, I, again. Yeah, I that's a fan, so, but yeah. getting that access yeah. in Last yeah. Rockstar, I didn't realize what if what to, to use Simon LeBond's language, what what mates those two guys were. But then you you watch the movie, and it's like, well, Christine, what what did he say? They they. Like, <laughs> he was like, like "You like to party? I like to party. All good." Oh, uh, <laughs> I, like I like girls. He like. Yeah, Simon was activities. 
he's the best guy in the movie. And and the funny thing is, like, see, I met Simon. Simon was around, like, like you know, because Paula would do a Sunday lunch every Sunday. And one Sunday, uh, uh, Simon came with with his, I can't remember the name now, this lady. She was a beautiful supermodel. Uh, oh, God, what was her name? Anyways, so, you know, and Paula would do these nice Sunday lunches, and we were all over there. And they were good friends. Yeah, they hung out a lot. And I met Simon with Michael, and then like I ended up getting to work with Duran Duran a little later, but that was after, um, or it might have been right around that time. But I, I maybe Michael hadn't passed away yet. I don't remember. It's all a blur. But it was in that period. It was for that movie, The Saint. I think we did mm -hmm. like a, a remix or a new ver an alternative version of one of the songs. But uh, yeah, Simon was really. They were tight. They were good. All the you know Michael, and Michael was a really likable person too. I mean, everybody loved it. It wasn't like you know. He was some aloof, you know. He didn't have any shortage of friends, that's for sure. <laughs> but I was really excited in um, doing my research for this interview with you. Um, thanks again for coming on and talking with us. Um, I'm a big U2 fan, and I saw, um, of course, in excess also, but I saw that you worked on the new EP that U2 just released, The Last Night on Earth, and um, Happiness is a Warm Gun has your name on it. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, well, that's a cool kind of, well, yeah, I mean, it, you know, I didn't do it. So what happened, the way I got connected with you 2 it's kind of a cool story because there was sort of, they were also big fans of Black Grape Record. I mean, even Bono and, you know, uh, 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 Adam gave me a bass. I mean, and he get, when I went out to work with him and he gave me this bass and he was like, you know, here, mate, I want you to have this, that, that, that. that's for all the bass lines I ripped off from, from Black Grape Record. I'm like, dude, are you, stop. I'm like, you know, every time I play a, a, an eighth note, it, 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 you know, come on, you know, it was it was, it was mind blowing. But uh, I got to do a lot of stuff with him. But what initiated it was uh, Butch Vig got asked to do a remix of Staring at the Sun. And um, Butch suggested that we do it together. And that sort of opened that door up, which was really, really cool because I got to do like two, three days. You did garbage stuff too then also, right? And we were talking about that with somebody about, it's like getting your, between like going in the studio with the Stones and then Butch Vig, it's like getting your masters in rock, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but then what happened was there was a show called The Gun um, and it was a pretty big deal. Like Robert Altman directed it and they had a, um, I think they might've even, it was like on, on an ADAT or something. They might've recorded it at a sound check. And they had done this kind of rough version of happiness is a warm gun. So they just sent it to me and they said like, here, do, you know, and they had a version of it that, that was just more of a straight mix, but they kind of gave it to me and let me do my thing. And that was that version. I love that remix. And then, and actually Tom Lord Algae actually like dialed it in for me, which was pretty cool. Cause Tom and I, you know, was, he's kind of one of my mentee, mix mentee mixers, mixing mentors. Um, he mixed the, the black rape record, you know, um, so oh, yeah, but um, the, the other cool thing I noticed, because you know more about this than I do, I didn't even know about that till you just told me. So I'm not sure what you're referring to, but the one thing I'm going to check it out, obviously. But the one thing I do know is when they went back and they did like a collection of remixes, and I think it was not like super long ago, but it wasn't like last week. I think I had two. I mean, imagine all the remixes you two's done, and I think they they put twelve of them on an album. And I had at least two. I might have had three on there, which was really cool. You know, that was like the best compliment because those were like, I guess, their favorite ones that they had put together. And I think it was still on a CD or some sort of package. So yeah, but I'll find, I'm going to look into that. That's cool. How long ago did that come out? Um, I just noticed it within the last week. <laughs> yeah, because I think it was the beach side of Last Night on Earth, but I'm not sure because the single had something on it. But I would have loved to work. I love that record. I love the pop record. I, I think that record. Yeah, it was the great. I saw that tour. That was a great. Yeah, well, it up. <laughs> or they kind of blew me up. I get the plan. I mean, I'm just. A, I'm no different than you guys, really. I'm just like the only difference is I'm a fan at heart, and 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 I've been lucky enough, and I never could have imagined this as a kid, to to get a chance to work with a lot of the people who made me want to do this in the first place. So whether it's the Stones or you, I'm just trying to make the record I want to hear as a fan. It's like when I worked with the Stones, I was always trying to get Mick to play the singing a falsetto. He's like, yeah, it's too much I miss you. It's like, no, it's too much this. It's like, miss you, do <laughs> You know, and and uh, I got Ozzy. You know, you've done it. Do it again. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, so it's just stuff like that where it's like, you know, and I mean, it was a while ago now. I was young, a lot younger than I am now. But uh, that's sort of, I think, what, what I brought to it that they at that time were looking for. The same with Michael, which was just some young, fresh perspective to sort of re-inject some life. Because if you think about it, the Stones and U2 are probably the only two bands who have been able to stay relevant. Their whole, I mean, it doesn't matter what they do, they're, you know, on the cover of Rolling Stone or- And same the, members. And, and same, well, yeah. And 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 stay relevant though. You know, the Beatles, like Keith says, they don't count, they cashed it in 69 or 70, whatever. You know, they didn't, you know, they're the gold standard for records, but like, you know, as a live touring entity, there's only two bands that, you know, have stayed, relevant their whole careers, you know, and uh, be hard pressed, you know, everybody else is, you know, and it's normal to have them. Like if you saw the Julian Temple thing, I love how he talked about Joe's wilderness years. I mean, Elvis made a comeback, you know, Frank Sinatra had to make a comeback. Everybody has to kind of, you know, you can't be like this forever, but those two bands have managed and they had their down cycles, but like the reality is still be standing and doing it and, in demand at this stage of the game, it's 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 it's, um, it's, not, it's crazy. I would also proffer ZZ Top in there, but yeah, like in terms of you know peaks, valleys, all that stuff, definitely. And that's another thing too. I really liked about uh, Last Rock Star, just seeing uh, that that clip of Michael when he went back because he did that gig with you guys at, at the Viper Room, mm -hmm. and. Then, a few days later, he's having those last rehearsals with the band, and he's giddy as a little fan talking about. I was playing with Billy Gibbons. Wow. Just that, that, that look, just that. Yeah. That was, cool. that well, that's what was cool about the Viper room. Like the way I, you know, that's what it was always intended to be. I mean, it was intended to be a place where a, like Johnny could have somewhere to go and chill and, and have fun and play. But then expanding on that and Sal ran it that way where anything could happen. Jimmy Dunlop was throwing some sort of party. So there was like a, and the band was, it was Stevie Salas and Bernard and myself and, uh, you know, um, my man from, um, well, what was that band called now? Not Blues Traveler, the, the guy with the little dreads, the short hair. He was sick, Adam, Adam. Durrett. Oh, yeah. Counting Crows. Counting Crows, yeah. And then, you know, and I remember I had to like kind of twist his arm you know, come on, Michael, just come on, do do one song. You know, we, we actually do get to play together with Black Grape once. He came and sat in with us, and but that was in London. But, you know, I'm like, come on, man, we got to jam together once, bro. Like, you know, mm -hmm. then once he got up there, what had happened was Billy Gibbons was walking down Sunset Boulevard, and Sal just happened to be out front. And he goes, hey, man, you know, we're jamming inside. Bernard, you know, Danny, because I know Bill. He, he's like, oh, shit. He goes, he pulls him in. Walks him in right at the moment. He's standing in front of me. We're doing Suffragette City. Michael's singing with Bernard. And I look down and Sal's like, Billy, I go like this. I go, come on. I pulled him up, took off the guitar, handed him the guitar right at the moment the solo started. He ripped this unbelievable solo, took off the guitar and handed it back to me. It was like magic, dude. Wow. People were losing their minds. And I mean, you know, of course, nothing. Nobody had phones then. <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine now? Well, it probably wouldn't happen. Only the stories. Uh, yeah, so that was the kind of magical shit that was in the equation at the Viper Room. Like anything, they just did a really cool sort of thing in Esquire, one of those magazines where they, you know, just showed a, you know, like an ex picture thing where they were showing all the different people that were there. You know, I wasn't there every night. I was there once in a while. There was all stuff, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff going on there, like super cool place, you know. I was in L.A. for 21 years before I moved here seven years ago to Arizona. And I, and I was telling Christine this early. That there's something going on in L.A. every night, but there's only two nights. I wish I could have been somewhere. That was one of them. And when uh, the Michael Bean tribute, where the, uh, the call got back together, Michael Bean's song, uh, son sang down at the Troubadour. There's two magical music moments in L.A. I wish I could have been at. Yeah, well... It's just, you know, there's a lot of, there was a, like, I mean, especially in the late 90s and stuff, L.A., there was, you know, it was a cool place, man, because everybody ends up there, you know, everybody's passed through, so all kinds of things were, 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 were possible, and the Viper Room was sort of the center of that, but yeah, I know what you're saying. Sunset Strip, rest in peace, for the most yeah. part. Yeah. 
Because it's pretty the much still standing. What's that? At least the whiskey's still standing. Because the vipers, the vipers, the vipers gone. Uh, the uh, the house of blues gone. Is yeah. the is the Roxy still around? Yeah, the Roxy's still there. Okay, good. And, and the and the um and the um, what you call it? The uh, the rainbow's still there. You know. But I, I mean, the Viper Room, I think, is still open, but its days are numbered. I don't know. Last time I drove by, was maybe it's not anymore. I don't know. Like, I saw it a couple weeks ago because I at least last time I remember, I was. Well, you know, last word I got from, from friends back there, I guess it's uh, going to be turning into pretty much a, another high rise or apartments or. Yeah, they're going to tear it all down, man. Like, the, the, everything. I mean, that's the problem with LA. We just lost. There's this really great uh, golf course, and it's just a little nine hole golf course and a driving range. But it's been there. I mean, the, the land has been there since like the probably the 1890s. It's been like an area for like recreation. But the the the, the golf place has been there since the 50s. And the guy who owned all the land was a rich family. Left it, it willed it to this um, willed it to the to his grandchildren or whatever. But he left it in his lease that the kid that the guy who owned the golf course business could keep it. You know, basically for whatever he kept the, the monthly rent really low. And long story short some school for like really rich kids bought the land and now it's all fenced off and that's going to be gone. So it's like, if something's 50, a hundred years old in LA, it's like, a th you know, a thousand years old in Europe. It's, it's, <laughs> it's sad. Nothing really, it always gets turned over here, you know, and that's why it's, it's kind of a weird place like that because there's, there's not a lot of things that have, you know, even like someone who's pretty much been here their whole life that, you know, things from when you were a kid, everything's just gone, you know, they just, they just, and then they put a strip mall or some shitty high rise or whatever. And it's, it's just, it just I mean, led down the direction I wanted to go with slight apologies to Chrissy Hine, the pretenders. I went back to LA and my city was gone. Yep. That's what happens. But she went back to, um, she didn't go back to LA. She went back, back to, to Ohio, Ohio. Ohio, back to the woods. Yeah. <laughs> good old mistake by the lake number two in my life yes good old cleveland <laughs> yeah chrissy was around too um you know the hanging out a bit with with michael and and i actually met chrissy too uh because joe strummer was around and so we were all hanging out together and then joe so i got to meet all like a lot of my heroes i mean first pretenders record james honey and scott jesus what a monster guitar player he was that was a really great band she had that first incarnation of the pretenders that's for well, the first two the first three albums oh, wow yeah no doubt i love james honeyman scott he was one of my favorites that's a guy who people you know need to kind of think about every now and then he was just an unbelievable guitar player well, Danny Saber, once again, thank you so much for this project coming out, The One Way and Save My Life. That's going to be coming out on Boss Sonics. Folks, don't forget to check it out over at BossSonics.com. For those of you not watching on YouTube, for our audio listeners, it's B-O-S-S-S-O-N-I-C-S.com. -S -S and Danny put together, he's uh, continuing to uh, maintain Michael Hutchinson's legacy, revitalize it as it should be. Uh, Michael Hutchins, NXS, an amazing legacy. And Danny, thank you once again for do, doing all the stuff that you're doing with this music. Yeah, thank, thanks for having me. And, and I appreciate you just like, again, mentioning Boss Sonics. Go out, check out the vinyl. Like I said, we're still in pre-sale mode, but uh, the wheels are in motion now. We got the test pressing. And uh, you know, we're going to have the vinyl soon. And I'm excited to get my hands on it, man. <laughs> It's, it's a really cool little little project. You know, I think Michael would have been really, really happy. And one last thing I'll say is, you know, he definitely would have been happy with the response we've gotten, you know, because it's it's been, you know, uh, uh, definitely picked up by the alternative press. And it's really being seen as an alternative record. You know, it's not some nostalgia. And that was, you know, key to him in this whole endeavor. Was, you know, it's just to be to be relevant and to be, you know, on the edge and, and up to date and not feeling like it's some nostalgia sort of throwback thing, you know, that's been one of the best sort of rewards and the response I've gotten from everybody, you know, starting with you guys. It's just like, everyone's feeling the music, you know, and that, that's the most important thing. And, 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 and just, you know, hearing his voice again on something fresh and, you know, it brings back a lot of great memories, but it also reminds you, you know, 
who he was and what he was about. Michael Hutchins, gone. And thanks to you, Danny Saber, never forgotten. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us again. My pleasure. All right, cool. folks, you've been listening to All Over the Place, the official podcast of Media Pub Live. Danny Saber, thanks again. Jim, Christine, great having you in the house. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back real soon on All Over the Place. Bye-bye. Sanity never ends.